Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is um, uh, Dr. Acevedo, and today I'm going to tell you about Huntington's disease. Um, I will start with um, a brief introduction. I will talk about the symptoms, show uh, some, some videos, talk about the pathogenesis, the diagnosis, and then the, the management. Uh, so Huntington's disease is a hereditary autosomal dominance neurodegenerative disorder, and it affects about one in 10,000 people, which is um, very common for a rare disorder. Um, in fact, it affects about 40,000 uh, people in the USA and a lot more people are, are at risk. Um, so it's caused by a mutation in, in the HTT gene in exome one, and it's a special type of mutation. It's a tunicotide repeat mutation. So um, in this portion of exome one, uh, there is a repetition of CAG, 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 um, and usually the, the number of repeats is below 26, but in some people it is um, above um, uh, 36, and uh, there is um, a reduced penetrance, so there is a chance that the person will develop um, Huntington's disease, and so, for some people, um, the, the number of, repeat, of repeats is above 40, and uh, it is certain that they will develop the disease. In fact, for some people who have over 60 repeats, they will develop the disease a lot sooner and will have juvenile HD, which starts below the age of 20. And it's interesting how this mutation um, is very unstable. So from one generation to the other, the number of repeats can increase, especially uh, when um, it, the, the disease is passed on by, by the father, because the number of repeats can e expand during, during uh, spermatogenesis. Um, there's also somatic instability within each tissue. So throughout our life, the, the mutation can increase, namely in the striatum, which you can see in this picture um, is really affected in HD. What symptoms do HD patients have? They have not only motor, but also cognitive and behavior symptoms. Um, there is um, a pre-symptomatic phase in which there are no symptoms, then a prodromal phase before the motor diagnosis in which there are already some symptoms, um, and then the, the symptoms evolve such that um, it starts with, with chorea, and then it's develops into a more uh, hypokinetic and pre um, um, phenotype. There, there, are, there are always motor, cognitive, and um, behavioral symptoms. Usually the age of onset is around 45, but um, as I mentioned, this varies. So five to 10% of the patients will have juvenile HD below the age of 20, and um, some will have, have habits after the age of 60. Okay, so a little bit more about the symptoms. So in terms of motor symptoms, um, there is chorea, which, is, um, which consists of involuntary brief irregular movement, movements that are not, not repetitive or rhythmic and appear to flow from one muscle group to the next. We'll see videos which will help, help understand. Um, it can also affect phonation, so the, the speech, and it uh, is usually uh, present at rest, but it disappears during the sleep. And it can be intensified when the person is distracted, and uh, the patients usually are not aware of the, of, of the movement, movements in the beginning, but um, as the disease progresses, they might start incorporating the, um, the craic dance-like movements into semi-intentional movements. Okay, but besides chorea, as I mentioned, um, later on we, we, we get different symptoms, um, such as bradykinesia, so um, more difficulty with voluntary movement, and dystonia, um, imbalance, and, and other symptoms. So uh, still, in terms of chorea, um, if it is more pronounced, and particularly in the, the proximal muscles, we can have balismus, which are dance-like movements, but with greater amplitude and speed, 
which can be very harmful for the patients and lead to uh, traumatic lesions. And there can also be acetosis, which is a slower dance-like movement um, uh, with a twisting nature. So dystonia is a bit different. It's also involuntary um, and it's associated with prolonged muscle contractions, sometimes agonist and antagonist muscles at the same time, and it causes repetitive and twisting movements and postures. Um, other motor symptoms are, um, or, or findings are changes in the eye saccades and also motor impersistence. So the patients can keep um, the same uh, movements uh, for, for a period of, period of time. For instance, uh, a hand grip um, would be very gentle. Um, they, there is even um, a, a term, uh, um, um, uh, um, uh, a milkmaid's um, grip for the, 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 the grip of an HD patient. Okay, but it's not all motor. There are also cognitive uh, issues, namely in terms of uh, working memory, uh, poor planning, in inflexibility, preservation, impulsivity, and also behavioral symptoms. Of the behavioral symptoms, apathy, uh, lack of initiative, um, initiative is very pronounced and it's present in almost one third of patients and it progresses with the disease, which is different from the other symptoms such as irritability, depression, and anxiety, um, and OCD, which are less frequent. Um, psychosis is relatively rare in um, this disease. Um, then there is juvenile onset HD, which is interestingly a bit different. So there's a lot more rigidity and bradykinesia, tremor, dystonia, and it progresses a lot faster. And Korea might be very tra uh, transient. Okay, but let's now look a bit at what the patients look like. Uh, okay, trying to find just one second. Okay, C can you see it? Yeah. So um, you'll notice this lady, um, sh the movements are completely involuntary. Some of them seem semi-intentional, um, but it, it's definitely Korea, a dance-like movement. And it's interesting that she actually didn't have, uh, didn't appear to have parents with HD, but because sh she was adopted, um, she didn't know them. Okay. I can also show you a, a different patient. You can see that the phonation is also a bit affected and there is retropulsion. And then I would also like to show you a different patient, now um, a pediatric patient, and you'll see how different it is. So, uh, you'll notice the dystonia in the hands and uh, the slight craic movements, but mostly the, um, the dystonia. Um, okay, and then I would also like to show you, uh, uh, to, to show you something that looks a lot more, a, a lot, um, uh, uh, that looks more like polysmus. So you see how the movements are a lot more pronounced and proximal. Okay, and then just um, a, an interesting part of the of the um, presentation. So notice how the eye movements are affected. He needs to actually move the the heads to follow the finger. Okay. Okay. So no, notice now the motor impersistence. He he just can't keep the movement. Yeah. So the patient really struggles with uh, 
these type of motor tasks. Okay, so back to the presentation. We've seen uh, different types of patients and it's important to understand how this disease affects their, their, their life. So um, for most patients, they will know from an early age an affected parent and they will be aware of their at-risk status. And so this is something they, will, they, they have to live with um, until they, um, they reach the age of 18, um, after which they can decide whether or not they want to know if they are going to develop the disorder um, through predictive genetic testing. And this is something that um, few people actually go through um, because uh, it's, a, it, it's a very hard life decision. Um, there still isn't um, a, um, a disease modifying treatment. And so only about 7% of patients actually go through. And um, it's, also it's also important to know that there is a real risk with taking this, um, this test because some, some patients may, um, may have uh, difficulty coping with the results and may uh, even commit suicide. So it's really important that uh, this type of information um, always be um, prepared so that um, the, the patient understands exactly what type of information he will uh, receive and uh, he can make a decision of whether or not he wants to receive it and that he receives it in the best possible way and with um, the best psychological support possible. Um, and so that's predictive presymptomatic testing. That's something very different from what happens if the patient already has symptoms. In that case, we really want to make sure whether it's HD or something else um, to be able to give the best treatment possible. So that's diagnostic testing. And uh, for instance, with this young lady, uh, it would make um, sense to test her for HD because she has a family history and she has symptoms. So it's important to know whether it's really HD to, to help her. Okay, so now I'm, I will try to make a summary of the research in this field for the last 30 years. Okay, this is a lot. I tried to make it as simple as possible. Okay, so we definitely know that there is a mutation um, which has a number of CAGs that is above 40. And this mutation is unstable. And it's particularly unstable if it is just CAGs and interrupted. If there is, for instance, a CAA, which also codes for uh, glutamine, it will interrupt the, the chain of CAGs and, um, and that way it will make the, the repeats more, more stable and um, the disease will happen later in life. Okay, but so what happens when you have a, a long CAG repeat without any interruptions? You get abnormal DNA secondary structures and these DNA secondary structures can interact with DNA repair machinery and DNA handling um, machinery. And that interaction leads to somatic and germline expansion. So um, when this type of machinery contacts with the, the, the CAG repeats, it leads to expansion of the repeats within the cells of, for instance, the striatum. And uh, the, the number of repeats keeps on growing. And, and so when the number of repeats goes above, a certain threshold, we have the start of pathology. So um, there are genetic modifiers in the DNA repair machinery that leads to um, an earlier or later age of onset. Okay, but we, um, that's how the pathology starts. How does, does it then translate to neuron dysfunction? So if you have a high CAG number, that will lead to changes in splicing. So instead of having the whole protein, you'll uh, start having more of just the, the, the small transcript um, with, the, with exon one, which seems to be more toxic. Or you can have the, the regular mutant protein 
ends have its then um, broken down into the shorter form. Uh, what happens then is that th the mutant HCT will aggregate both in the cyto uh, cytoplasm and in the nucleus, and it will in impair, impair lots of things in the cell. So it will impair the uh, transport between the nucleus and the, um, and the cytoplasm. It will impair proteostasis, axonal transport, transcription, translation, the mitochondria, synaptic function, a lot of things. There are also new mechanisms such as uh, transcription of the repeat itself. So transcription starting on the repeats, which is very different from what we're used to. But um, everything is still being discovered. So there's a lot of unknowns about how the pathology leads to neuron dysfunction, but um, um, there are already many findings um, that could all happen at the same time. So um, once we get neuron dysfunction, how does that lead to symptoms? Okay, so um, as I mentioned, the CAG expands particularly in some tissues, namely in medium spiny neurons of the striatum. And it starts with the indirect pathway. And when this pathway is impaired, then you get an hyperkinetic phase with preeminence chorea. Then there is a prion-like sp uh, spread um, and the direct pathway is also affected. And um, then we get an hypokinetic phase with bradykinesia and dystonia. And then it also spreads to other parts of the brain leading to other, the other symptoms that we mentioned. So uh, just to give you um, a, a picture, you see here how in early HD, uh, we have an impairment of the indirect pathway and that leads to a hyperkinetic output, while in late HD, um, when both, um, both pathways are affected, the output is a bit different, it's hypokinetic. And it's interesting to understand that the basal ganglia are involved in a lot more than just um, movement. So they're also involved in limbic, limbic circuits and uh, cognitive circuits, which could help explain how, um, how there are symptoms also in terms of cognition and behavior. So how do we actually diagnose um, HD? So we need a family history, or a positive genetic test, and then we need onset of motor disturbance. Um, and th the way it's defined is through the uni unified HD rating scale. Um, so you need a total motor score um, of four or more. And um, this is something that you calculate looking at all these features, which are all scored from one to four. So um, one being very little um, uh, change and four very, um, very strong change that's, um, is, um, that leads us to think of HD. So we have ocular pursuit, saccades, um, dysartria, tongue protrusion, uh, dystonia, chorea, retropulsion, finger taps, um, pr pronation, supination of hands, luria, I don't know if you know this, but Luria is, um, so it's a sequence of movements. It's fist, hands, palm. Um, I don't think you're, you're, you're seeing my, uh, uh, seeing me, but um, so it's a specific sequence. And so it's, it gives more information about the, the cortex. So um, being able to, to program a sequence of movements. And it's a bit different from this diadochal kinesia which is more cerebellar, it, which is involved in rapid alternating movements. Okay, and also rigidity of, of the arms, body kinesia, uh, gates, which can uh, become widened and tandem walking. So lots of features which we can then monitor to assess uh, progression of the disorder, but in order to consider motor um, onset, uh, it has to be four or more. Okay, and if you only have family history, then it's definitely interesting to um, also get an MRI or a CT to look for colored atrophy and uh, to, to have some consistency 
and also to check for the, the thyroids and for uh, Wilson, so looking at copper and seroloplasmin, uh, because you, you want to make sure that it's not a, a different type of chorea. And as I mentioned, there is a pre-manifest pre stage in which before the motor onset, which can, can happen 10 to 15 years before the, this onset. Okay, and you can monitor other things to get a fuller picture uh, in terms of cognition, in terms of behavior, uh, for instance, moods, anxiety, suicidal, uh, suicidal thoughts, which can be very, um, very prevalent when the symptoms start, um, irritability, um, OCD, and hallucinations, even though they are relatively, um, um, uh, uh, they are not so frequent. So one interesting test is the Stroop inter interference test, which tests the ability to inhibit cognitive interference. And after um, the motor onsets, this is something that really changes and that allows us to, um, to, to monitor the, the progression. So you can see how um, it's more difficult when you have a blue and you have to say the color is green. So there's an interference. Okay, and um, there, there's also a um, assessment of the functional status, the independence, and the functional capacity. And this is important because you can predict what kind of care the, the patient will need. And it can, you can be ahead of things so that you can provide the best care possible. Okay, and um, there have been a lot of observational clinical trials, so now we know that um, in terms of the, the MRI, we can see before the functional changes, changes in um, brain atrophy, in particular of the caudates and white matter. Um, we can also start seeing some pre-manifest changes um, when we look at patients uh, two years after, um, and um, namely in the, the motor score, um, emotion recognition, and speed type tapping. Okay, um, and there are new quantitative assessments that can help us um, keep up a better uh, monitoring of the patient, especially for trials. Okay, so is it just HD? In 7% seven, in 7 of patients, there is a HD pheno phenocopy. So you don't have the HD mutation, but you have career cognitive and neuropsychiatric disservices. And so uh, for these cases, um, only a small portion, in, only in a small portion can you identify the, um, the cause. It could be C9 ORF, it could be um, a spinocerebellar ataxia, or HD um, like, like syndrome 2, especially in um, a people with, um, uh, from an uh, African uh, population. Um, you should also uh, be, um, be aware of other symptoms, such as ataxia and peripheral neuropathy, which could suggest spinocerebellar ataxia or fetish ataxia, seizures, with, which could suggest, suggest tentatorubral uh, pallidolusian atrophy, um, and you could also look at um, iron in the M MRI uh, because of iron accumulation disorders and look at the peripheral blood for acanthocytes, so misshaped um, erythrocytes, which are suggestive of neuroacanthocytosis. And um, you can also look at uh, causes of chorea in general, and so you'll get a, a lot of things that could cause it. So chorea is different from having motor and cognitive and behavioral, so, uh, which is um, more like HD. So for chorea, anything that affects the striatum, um, be it vascular, tumoral, or brain injury, could um, be um, at the source of it. There is also chorea associated with pregnancy um, and also uh, with lupus, um, thyroid problems, and post-infectious syndromes. So about 20% um, of, um, of people with rheumatoid fever can develop chorea. Um, th there are also other, other things that can lead to chorea, such as drugs, um, uh, neurometabolic conditions such as Wilson, um, and even a deficiency of vitamin B12 in some case reports, um, and other toxic vascular and hereditary conditions. And uh, if you want to look at Korea, there is a lot that you can, can, can um, uh, explore 
but what's really important is the history, when it starts, whether um, there is a family history, um, uh, whether it's static or if it progresses, um, whether it's focal or not, um, and there are some laboratory tests that can help you rule out different conditions. But um, I, I don't want to um, stray away from the focus, which is HD. So how can we manage it? Um, so it really takes a multidisciplinary approach. So it's not just a physician, it's also nurses, a physiotherapist, speech and language therapists, dietitians. Uh, so these patients lose a lot of, um, of, of weight and, and can have trouble swallowing. So um, nutrition is uh, key to, to uh, make sure um, the, the patients are well. And you really want to optimize quality of life and be prepared to respond to changing needs. Um, and then let's look at pharmacological, non-pharmacological interventions. So for Korea, we have VMATS2 inhibitors, such as um, tetrabenazine and deltrabenazine. Um, so tetrabenazine um, helps with Korea, but can lead to sleep problems and uh, particularly de depression and anxiety. Deltetrabenazine um, um, is a modified version that has a longer half-life and uh, possibly less uh, depression and somnolence. Uh, we can also uh, use for Korea neuroleptics, such as um, olanzapine, um, but they uh, naturally have sedation and weight gain, which uh, in this case isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, so in terms of the abnormal gait, poor balance and frequent falls, physiotherapy can help. Um, the psychiatric symptoms, there isn't a lot um, of literature to, to help decide on the, the best treatment for HD patients, but we can treat the, the symptoms um, according to, 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 um, to, to the best practices for, for each symptom. So for instance, for depression, anxiety, OCD, and irritability, we can give um, an, an, um, antidepressants such as uh, SSRIs and also mirtazapine and Venlafaxine, uh, and uh, for the aggression and psychosis, we can give uh, neuroletics and cognitive behavioral therapy, even though uh, after cognitive impairments, it becomes more difficult. And for apathy, that's very frequent uh, a symptom. Uh, there isn't a lot of evidence, but some people have tried um, amphetamines and um, amantadine, but there really isn't evidence. For the cognitive symptoms, it's, um, it, it's very disappointing. Um, so anticholinesterase inhibitors and citalopram don't seem to um, have a very convincing results. Some coping strategies can help, such as changes at, at the work setting, a quieter environment, and less uh, multitasking. Okay, so new therapies in development. There's a lot of, um, of research that's being uh, translated now to clinical trials. Um, some is looking at the, the source of the disease in the DNA using gene editing tools such as zinc fingers and CRISPR-Cas9 and to try and um, get out the, the mutated gene and um, change it for um, a, 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 a normal allele. That's still in, in development. Closer to, to the patients is, um, are uh, the RNA therapies. So ASOs and RNA, RNAi, they are a, a bit different. So ASOs can act as the pre-mRNA um, stage and leads to mRNA destruction through a different machinery from um, RNAi. So there are ASOs already being developed which lower HTT as a whole and they are delivered through interthecal injections on a monthly basis. And there are some therapies which are a little specific, so they only silence the mutated um, allele. So, uh, for instance, if the allele come, uh, the the uh, the mutated allele comes only from the father, you can um, develop um, an ASO specific for that allele, so as to preserve the the good allele. Um, and that's important because um, 
the ATP gene has, has functions and it's important for brain development. It's actually embryonically lethal if you switch it off. So usually this, this would be uh, therapies for, for adults. Okay, and so there are also other uh, therapies being developed that focus on neuroinflammation and proteostasis and many other mechanisms. So take home messages. HD can affect patients of all ages, as, as you have seen. The symptoms are not just chorea, they're also cognitive and behavioral. It's first hyperkinetic and then I, I, hypokinetic. And predictive and diagnostic testing are different things. You wouldn't test um, a child that doesn't have symptoms. Uh, that child should have the, the chance to choose for herself at a later age. Okay, and then um, there's an evolving understanding of pathology. Um, and it's interesting that these mechanisms uh, seem to be preserved across uh, trinucleotide repeat disorders. Okay, um, also don't forget that there are other causes of chorea and that um, you need to, to treat the patient as a whole and there is hope for new um, treatments. I would like to thank everyone for, for your attention and in particular thank the, the program for having um, had me for this uh, six weeks. I, I really enjoyed my time here. Thank you. <laughs>